Right, we have like a, a warm-up comedian, right? Does anyone want to have a joke they want to talk about? Why did the chicken cross the street? Because the grass was greener on the other side? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> exactly. That's bad. Nick. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. I actually have a joke. I have a joke, okay? All right, I have a joke. Listen up. The first joke I have, it goes like this. So they're standing on the Titanic, right? There's a French guy, there's an American guy, and there's a Japanese guy. And they all look at each other, they go, what do we do? And they're like, yeah, well, this, the ship is sinking, right? So the French guy, he looks at, every, at the other guys, he goes, yeah, you know, I will jump for love. Boom, he jumps off. The American guy goes, wait, I wanted to jump first so I could be a hero. And in the end, the Japanese guy is standing like this, and some guy comes up and says, hey, you know, everyone else is jumping. Okay, I'll jump. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're ready? This is working? Okay. Three, two, one, and we are live. Welcome to the Mastermind, created by Nicholas Pettis. Our guest today is none less than Francisco Filio! The objective of the mastermind clearly is to create some kind of bond and understanding and some kind of relationship with the guests on the show. Today we're going to learn about Francisco Filio's journey through martial arts. What took him from a small city in the northern part of Brazil to Tokyo, fighting in Tokyo Dome in front of Almost 100,000 people. He's the first non-Japanese ever to become the world champion of Kyokushin Karate. Oh my God, big round of applause again. He's also a good friend of mine, and I am proud to call him an older brother. I'm a little bit nervous of having him on the show here today, but I'll deep dive right into it with some of our experiences together and also see if I can learn something from him that I've never learned before. I have lots of questions. While we will be talking, I hope you come up with some questions on your own. Think about something that you find might help you on your journey. Um, he has been through an incredible story through martial arts for more than four, four decades, I think. When did you actually start? 11. <laughs> so 41 years ago. 41 years ago. Let's start right there. Where and how did this all begin? Wow, Nick. Oh, it's really good to be here with you. Oh, so really, and Nick is a very, he's not just a very good friend. He's very, 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 very good friend. <laughs> uh, I respect him a lot. Uh, actually, when I went to live in Japan, he was my neighbor. And I couldn't speak any English by that time. I still cannot speak English, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm improving, I mean, I'm trying hard. But Nico was my sensei. Actually, I learned English with him. I learned a little Japanese with him as well. So, uh, okay, besides that, I started training Kyokushin when I was 11 years old. That is 41 years ago. Uh, I got uh, fascinated with uh, films on TV. So Shaolin, Kung Fu, Bruce Lee, and I remember I've seen guys fly from one tree to another tree. And then I said, oh, I would like to do this. And then I went to dojo. But when I got to the dojo, nobody was flying. I was like, hey, <laughs> what's this? Uh, this is not much of that I saw. And then with the time, I realized that it was only fantasy. So, but that is actually what brings us to do martial arts, it's the fantasy. And actually, you can have fantasy. You must have something that is, is not just a small thing, because it's not a normal thing. So it should be something more like a fantasy that, that's really uh, ask you to go, make you go. So it's really important for you to dream. So dream, but actually dream big, not small. A dream big, that's, uh, that's easy to say when, when you have uh, created the results that you've created in your life. But let's slow it down a little bit. So your number what of how many brothers and sisters? Actually, uh, I was number 
five, five, <laughs> six? <laughs> yeah, five, um, no, actually six, and then my little uh, daughter, seven. And when I was uh, five years old, um, my father decided to move from the place we were. Um, he, wants, he wanted a better life for us. And then he decided to move to Sao Paulo, which is like 2,000 kilometers from my home city. And then we moved to Sao Paulo when I was five years old, and my brother was six years old. And my brother was like my twin brothers. And we used to do many things together. And probably I'll, I'll be a little bit sad, but that's normal, okay? But, and then when we got to Sao Paulo, uh, and then we didn't, we didn't understand things very well. So we, we didn't have a chance to see a car. Uh, I remember also a funny thing. Uh, in, my, in my previous city, in my uh, hometown city, um, we didn't have toilet. We had to go outside the house, and then there was a hole, and then we do that things over there, and then come back to home. But then when we got to Sao Paulo, there was the place that you sit down and put water. And then when we did that, we were like, wow, we had so much fun just to see the water clean that thing. We had fun just by seeing that. And then uh, about cars, we have never have seen cars. And then the street that we live was like a, a hill like this. And then we were playing outside. Uh, I don't know how to say that. It's like a kind, a kite. Kites, yeah. Kites, yeah. yeah. So you, you like, I will play with kites. And then um, the thing that uh, involves the, the line uh, is like a can. And the can drop, and my brother went to pick up the, 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 the can. But there was a car that came in, poof, and then he hit his head on the wall, and he died. And I was only five, and I saw that, and I was very shocked. And suddenly, he was not there with me no more. And that was hard for me, very hard, because I was like I told you, I was number six. And then, because we were so big, and then sometimes people don't pay too much attention for the kids. And you are over there listening to many things. And they start talking about God and this and that. I was like, oh, what's going on? And where is my brother? Because why they all are crying? I didn't understand. And then I was just all the time trying to hide myself and think about my brother. Where's my brother? And always looking for that. And I never find that an answer. And sometimes my heart feels so painful. And I could not find nobody to help me, actually. And then I lived with that. But then suddenly, uh, I went to school. And in school, take my, this trouble away. And then I start being more interested in study. And then I forget about that. Whew, I did not cry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good <laughs> job, man. Yeah, good job. <clears throat> so, so what I find very interesting is that every time um, we talk to someone uh, during these sessions is that we, we really get to understand that we're all just humans and we all go through hardships and, and there's, uh, if we go longer and further down this story, which we will, there's more hardships in your lives. There's also really big highs and lows and the valleys are very, very low, but the highs are also extremely high. Um, so you're in school now, uh, you've, you've lost your brother and that's clearly made a huge impact on your life because you still talk about it and it's something that you will carry with you forever. Uh, may he rest in peace. Um, we peace. hope so. Yeah. Thank you. And so you, uh, you stumble upon karate because you wanted to fly from tree to tree. I mean, I think we've all seen martial arts movies. The first martial arts movie that I personally saw when I was a little bit too young to go and see Enter the Dragon with my dad. And he took me to this movie theater in Denmark and he said to me, look, you're gonna have to stand tall because you're a little bit too short to get seen in this movie, right? And he says, oh, okay, I can, I can be tall. So I pretend to be tall. And he looks at me and says, this guy, whoo, whoo, you know, he's choo choo. Well, and he had, my dad had no idea what martial arts was, but he knew Bruce Lee, right? So we walk into the movie theater, he sneaks me in, you know, we sit down and I go, wow. And that was my first experience with martial arts. It, it, it didn't do anything for me except that I was, I was mesmerized by it. But you truly, because you wanted to fly from tree to tree, ended up in a Kyokushin dojo. Was Kyokushin the first dojo you actually entered in? Yes, the first dojo. But in, my, in that time, my mind was just to stay, maybe until you get brown belt and then jump to another martial arts. I was looking for something 
that I could not find in any place because my heart was like empty uh, because of the loss of my, my brother, I think. And just now I, I realize why that happens to my life. And when I, when I try to teach, when I try to give a class, I always uh, try to explain what I really care. What I really care is about mind, it's not about body. And for that time that my brother died, it's just to show me that our mind is forever. Our body, it, it can change, but our mind, no. But I, I did not understand. Just now I know for, for sure that it's always about your mind. So you have to be really relaxed and, and see things that happens to you, just as an opportunity for you to grow, nothing else. If you think like that, you're gonna be in peace with you. Martial arts try to do this, to get to peace. But it's not peace against, no, it's not like if the countries are getting uh, in war or not, but the peace with yourself. And then once you start to train hard, as hard as you can, so, and when you beat yourself, because everybody says, no, you, you're not able to do 100 mil comité, you're not able to, to, hunt, to run 40, two kilometers because you are more than 100 kilos. So these kind of things is just to test yourself, to test your mind. And then once you can go over your mind, and then you see that there is something else besides that small mind, there is a bigger mind behind that. And we are all this bigger mind, and we don't know. So that's why you have to keep practicing. Training hard, try to beat yourself, and then you're gonna reach that, that big mind. So, and then when I started training Kyokushin, I was actually looking for that and I didn't know. And I just knew a couple of years ago, it was not when I, when, when I won the world tournament. So it took me a while to understand that. So that's why I try to tell people, try to beat yourself. But it's not a bad, bad thing that if you, if you cannot beat yourself, it's not a bad thing. So just keep trying, all the time try. And so I, w I went to Kyokushin Dojo, and then 11 years old, and then when I was 14, I was brown belt. And then I was like, I could, uh, I, I could say that was enough because my mind was, okay, enough. I don't need to do anything more. I have to go to another martial art. But then I said, no, I like Kyokushin. I like, and I want to stay. And I'm really, really happy that I stayed. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> So you're a brown belt at 14 years old, and you're starting to train with the grown-ups at this point, right? And so what senpai would you say had um, a big impact on you, and when did you actually start to compete? Those are two questions in one. Okay. <laughs> well, my senpai was actually the son of my seisei. And he was, he was actually my seisei, because the seisei had two dojo, and most of the time he was in another dojo. And his son, Futoshi Mori, he fought in, in a world tournament in Japan. And, and for me, he was like incredible. I was like, wow, so strong. He was like five years older than me, or maybe more. And for me, it was always uh, a pleasure to see him training. And I was always, uh, take him as a mirror, I mean, uh, something that I would like to be like. And then we, while we were training, sparring, he kicked my ass all the time. <laughs> he was too strong. And then, of course, I always was, was, uh, respect him a lot. And then uh, I was 14, and then I competed in a tournament when I was 12, first tournament. Mm. And my first tournament, I lost in the first bout. First bout, lose. So if, if you are not sure what you want, sometimes when you face difficulties, you give up if you're not sure. But once if you are sure in what you want, what you really want, nothing is gonna stop you, nothing. You can almost die, but you keep, you keep going. So first thing that I recommend to you is to find out what you really, really want. So I really wanted to be champion. And then I lost in the first tournament. And the next year, I was 13. Um, first year, I was 12 when I fought. I was blue, uh, blue belt. And then next year, uh, 13, I was green belt. And I won three fights. 
And then the next year, I was second place. And then only three years later, no, four years actually, eh, I won uh, for the first time. I was like 16 years old, and I was so proud. I'm like, yes. But it's not about just win the tournament. It's about, not about win that tournament when I was 16. It was about winning all the time. Because if you wish something, and then once you get, and then you go like, okay, now I don't want no more. So that means that you don't really want that. And life is, there are so many things like this, that come to us and then go, come and go. But when it comes to your inner you, really inside of you, the thing, you never stop. You never stop. So I kept trying to fight and I want more, I want more. And I still want more now. Of course, I don't need to fight in the world tournament, but I'm fight against myself all the time. But as I told you, it's not bad that uh, sometimes you think, like, oh, I did not good, I'm, I fought really bad, or oh, I didn't do the push-ups good, or oh, I'm fat, I did this, that. Don't worry about that. We're gonna have ups and downs all the time. The best thing is always try to look up to get a little bit better. It doesn't matter where you are. So that's what I'm trying to do and, uh, uh, until now. Mm. I mean, you've always been working very hard at, at your craft and your skill. Um, and, you, and you seem very philosophical about the whole aspect of what martial arts and specifically what karate does for you. Um, but at 16, you win the South American Championships, right? 18. The Brazil? Uh, 18. 16, okay. I won the first Sao Paulo tournament when Sao I was Paulo 16, tournament. junior. All right, so at 18, you win the whole South American Championships. Now, at what point in, in your mind um, do you feel, if there is a specific point that you can pinpoint down, where you think, okay, I, I might be really, really good at this, and I, I might want to go all the way, because you know there is a world tournament at one point coming very soon. You're still 18 years old. And at what point in your mind are you thinking, hey, maybe I should just focus on this fighting thing? But, and I know you very, very well. I also know that all during these fighting years, you always stayed very close to the source of what karate is, to the inner spiritual journey. Um, so yeah, I want you to like, tell us about like, that transitioning period in your life where you think, okay, now I'm South American champion. Like, what else is there out there for me? <laughs> yeah. Uh... I was Sao Paulo tournament champion when I was 16. And then when I was 17, uh, again, I won the Sao Paulo tournament. And then uh, when I was 18, three times Sao Paulo tournament. And I have to face my sensei, so my senpai. My senpai, as I told you, he was very strong, he was taller than me, bigger than me. And for me, all the time, look at him, like, wow. But he never win a tournament, never win a tournament. Even Sao Paulo tournament, he lose. He was in another category, he was adult category, but he lost. And I was like, why he lose? He's so, so strong. And then, well, I was 16, first time Sao Paulo champion, and he lost in adult category. And then I was 17, I won, and he lost. And then 18, I faced, I was out adult when I was 18 in Sao Paulo category. And I have to fight him in the semi-finals. And then I look at him and I say, my God, now I have to fight my Seisei. And in that time, there was um, the draw, the way they did the draw that time was really hard. So finish with three fighters. So three fighters have to fight against each other and have to win twice. If you win twice, and then you are the champion. But if he, for example, I fight you and then you have to fight, I, I fight you, I beat you, and then I have to fight him. And then if I lose to him, he has to fight you. And then if he wins against you, he has to fight me again. And then he can never stop. <laughs> because you have to win two times in a row. So, and then Shihan Izobi came to me, and then we were like, me, my sensei, and Luis Feitosa, a very good friend of mine too. And then you came, and then that is letter A, B, and C. And she hide and say, okay, which one? A, fight with B, C, don't fight. And then I took and then, oh shit, what is mine? And then uh, I saw C, oh, 
<laughs> C is the best because AB has to fight. And then AB fought. And then uh, A, he was already Brazilian champion. Mm. Uh, but he was a little bit small and he, he beat my Seisei. And then, but I, I look at him, I was like, no way, I'm gonna beat this guy. I'm gonna beat him. Because one year before, uh, I, lost, I lost to him. Yeah. One year before, when I was 17, uh, it's Sao Paulo uh, tournament. You have juniors category, you have adult category. So, because I won, won the previous year, and then in that year I want to fight in both categories, like the champion this time. The champion, he fought and he won both. Wow. <laughs> but I won the juniors, and then I, I went to fight in, in the uh, open category. And I win my first fight, and, but I was very injured. My leg was very sore. I remember my leg was like two centimeters bigger than this one by getting kick. kick because it was really hard, really tough tournament. But I won the first match, and then the second match was against Luis Feitosa, that was my, my, my good friend. Mm. But before the fight, he came to me, and he knew I was injured. He said, oh, how, how is your leg? I said, man, you saw, my leg is very sore, but let's fight. And he's like, <laughs> okay, but he's softball. And my leg, mm. this leg was hurt. And then I was worried about his left leg, <laughs> but he didn't use his left leg, he just came Right here, use his right leg. That's the kind of friend we have. That's my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> and then I remember I didn't want to lose. I didn't want to be KO. Mm. And in that time, there was no Vasari. Mm. And then he started kicking me. And I remember he, he kicked me, and I was like this. Uh, and then I, I was like that. But don't go down, and there was no Vasari, but there was no Ipon because I was like, it's still like this. And, <laughs> and then oh, he kept taking, I was like, oh, oh, no, no, no. And then suddenly they think, oh, sorry, this guy, okay. And then they gave the Ipon to him. But I didn't go down. I said, no, I will not go down. <laughs> anyway, I lost to him, and now was my revenge. Right. And I was with advantage now, because he fought my Seisei, and he was tired. Uh, and he had to fight right away. He don't have any minutes to relax. That's crazy. Yeah. And then I was like, now it's my turn. And I start like very aggressive to him. <laughs> and I win easily, first round. And then next, my Seisei. And now I was tired. And then my friend relaxed, and he was cheering for my Seisei. Go, go, Futoshi, Futoshi, kick hard, Futoshi. And I was like, hey, man, shut up. And my, my sensei is play hard with me. Yeah. And then suddenly my sensei kicked my balls. Oh. Poof. And then I was, oh no. I said, now I said, no, why you did this? I was like, uh, I must win. So, and uh, okay, stand up. And I give him back. <laughs> I kick his ball. <laughs> I said, boom. And then, oh, okay, now I can relax a little bit because this is not fair. And I kick him back. <laughs> pro pro Proposal, I'm sorry, but it was. <laughs> but he kicked me aside, no way. And then I actually beat him because I saw if I lose to him and then I have to face and then the, the same thing is going to happen again. So that's my chance. I cannot lose. This is my chance. You have to grab. When you see opportunity, don't waste it. You have to get it. And actually, before, when I was 16, First time I, w I was champion. Um, me, uh, Sao Paulo tournament, a very small tournament, and then many categories in, 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 the, in the court, many. And then the last category was mine to finish because we have so many fighters in that category. And then the final uh, in that time was not, was not like you cannot go for weight. You have to win by fighting. Mm -hmm. It's draw, and then you fight one more, and then one more, one more. You fight until someone win. And then draw, draw. I think we draw about seven times. What? Seven <laughs> times draw. And then referee said, okay, uh, I called the, the table. The table said for you guys to re relax a little bit. Sit down, sit down, relax, and then come back. And then we turn, and then he say, sit down, Cesar. And I did, I did Cesar. And I went down, and I closed my eyes. And then I say, no way. No way, stand up and go and fight. That's what you want. And then suddenly I just stand up and the guy was like, 
relaxing, but I was like, okay, that's my time. I can not have to waste. <laughs> there will be not another chance for me next year. I don't want to come all this way again because this was so hard already. So now I have to beat him. And then I was ready to beat him. And then he came, he was like, I already lose. Yeah, yeah. And then I beat him and I was like, okay. So the chance, always about the chance. Because next year in the Brazilian tournament, I faced this guy again oh. and he didn't want to fight me. He was like, no. <laughs> he was like, oh, okay, not with you. You see, so the chance, grab the chance when you have the chance, don't lose the chance. So that's what happened. I beat my Seisei and then I was number one in Sao Paulo, but there was no Brazilian tournament in that time because we were going for the South America tournament. And I was number one in South America tournament. And then, uh, that was the fifth South America tournament. And four times Brazil was champion. Uh, and now the team of Brazil is totally new. Mm. Uh, and the Chilean, Chilean guys and also Uruguay, Uruguay, Uruguay guys, they want to be the champion. Because they say, okay, now Ademir Costa is not fighting no more. And James Kitamura, they were the best two Brazilians. They, they are not fighting no more, so probably now it's our chance to win. But I was the leader of my team. Mm -hmm. I was 18 years old. And my Seisei was in the team too, because it was five people from Brazil. And then he was qualified, because he was the best three in Sao Paulo. And then we go like, okay, so I have to show something. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we went to, the, to this first, first trip for me to, uh, to go outside the country. Is it, where was this held? Uruguay. Uruguay. Yeah. Uruguay. Uruguay, it's, in that time, it was like 32 hours by bus. We went by bus, 32 hours. And then we get there, and then we start to fight, and the Uruguay, they were like crazy. 5,000 Urugu Uruguay is like screaming, oh, Uruguay, Uruguay. So we were like, oh. And then I see the Chilean guy, they were like, oh, very cocky, like, okay, now it's my turn, we're gonna win. Man, but when the fight starts, Brazilian guys, they were like crazy. We've been training for that tournament for five months. Just after the Sao Paulo tournament, uh, the team was formed, and Ademir Costa just killed us training. It was like five hours training. Five hours, but very hard training, not one drop of water in that time. Four. <laughs> yeah, it was really hard. So we were like dying to fight. And then when we started the fight, we started killing everybody. And it was the best uh, qualification of Brazil ever in the South American domain. was number one, number two, number three, number four, and number six, oh. Brazil. And then I had to face my Seisei again oh. in the semi-final. And my leg was so, so, so sore. And I was like, oh man, my leg's sore. And my Seisei come and say, and my Seisei it went very smooth, no problem. He, he won by KO many times. And then I had to fight really hard. And I remember there was one last Uruguay, only one last Uruguay for the, for the quarterfinals. Mm. So the Uruguay, all the Uruguay was against me. And then when we start fight, one minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, they, they want the Uruguay to beat me. <laughs> and the Uruguay was losing, but they didn't stop the fight. But I was killing him. And then I knocked him out outside the, <laughs> the area. Yeah. And then they say, no, no, it's not, he cannot, come back here. And then we come back, <laughs> and then okay. Finally I won, but I was very, very, very sore. And then I saw, I, I showed to my say, say, oh, my leg, my leg, I think this leg was very sore. Yeah. And that one, not so bad but was bad. And then he, say, he came to me and said, how, how, how are you? I saw your, your injury. I said, yeah. I, and then I show him. I, I show him, I, I show him, yes. Uh, the this bad one. one. Yes, yeah. the bad one. Uh, but, and then that one I kept it. And then I say, oh, th this, this is not so bad. That one is very bad, but I, I didn't show this one. Yeah. I didn't show, I show only the good one actually, but it was bad. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was bad, so I kept that one. And then he said, okay. But then when the fight started, I used that leg that he wasn't expecting. <laughs> right. And then I smash him and I win. Oh. And then I went for the, to the final. In the final, my friend again, Luis Feitosa. And we were both like <laughs> all, all sore. And then uh, there was a strategy that Ademir Costa taught us. Say, mm. okay, so the fight is three, two, two. And then there is a break, it's, it's uh, Hikiwaki, and then we start again, three, two, two. So three, two, two was draw. And then he said, and then when he starts the next bound, 
uh, you should uh, wait a little bit, and then at the last minute, you do your best. In the last minute, you do your best mm. because the guy is going to be tired. That's the strategy that he taught us. And yeah. then I say, okay. And then, and then I thought, okay, so my friend, he's thinking about that strategy. So I go before him. I, I, I would like to do something to surprise him. So instead of do my best at the end, I'll do my best at the beginning. <laughs> and then when the fight starts, I start, and he also did the same. <laughs> <laughs> and then he came like, ah, and then we both got tired. <laughs> so we were like, oh, we die. And then, but he was smaller than me. And then he put his head here. And that time it was okay. He put his head here and he was punched like this. So tired. And then I don't know from where, I just put my leg behind and kicked him. Joe Damar almost took his head off. Whew, was very strong. And then, poof, he fell down. I started had concussion. Oh. And I was so stupid in that time when I was 18. <laughs> and then he was had a concussion. And then I saw and someone from the audience say to me like this. And I was like, hey. And then someone kissed. And then I said, kiss. <laughs> and then I see my brother there, like dying. Like, oh. I was like, oh, shit. Because one year later, I saw the video. I was like, oh, man, I'm so ashamed. Why yeah. did I do this? So that is the story. I'm sorry, I got too excited, guys, <laughs> and tell details. Oh, they're great stories, they're yeah. great stories. I mean, I mean, you, re you clearly have a, an interesting view on what fighting is for you and, and, and bringing back memories like that from the time in your life when you're still, yeah. you're still young, right? I mean, but then you turn 20 and, and you're going to Japan now. And at this time, this is in 1991. And uh, personally, I had just started as a uchideshi at the Hombu Dojo. Uh, in, in March. So in November is the World Tournament. So I'd been there for six, eight months. And uh, I remember seeing all the different teams from all over the world coming in. And, and the Brazilian team was, there was a lot of buzz about this young kid. For me, he's like two years older than me, so it's not a young kid. But everyone was talking about this new Brazilian kid. He's coming up and they talk about Filio, Filio. And I, I was like, yeah, Filio, I don't know about Filio. No. Because listen, Andy Hoog was fighting in this tournament. Andy Hoog. He was my idol. I used to have a poster. My idol too. <laughs> I used to have a poster of Andy Hoog on the ceiling on, on top of my bed so I would dream about him when I was going to sleep every night. Anyway, you're at the world tournament. Like, tell us like, the, some experiences and feelings that you had and then also clearly run us through the experience of actually having to fight Andy Hoog because this, this completely changed your life. Exactly. So. Andy Hoog is my guiding star. Um, uh, since when I was 15 years old, I think, I used to see the World Tournament. And the fourth World Tournament was the best World Tournament for me ever. So Andy fought against Kancho Matsui in the final. And I was like so impressed. And also I saw Masuda fighting very, very strong, very strong Geda Mawashigiri, Kurosawa also. And I was so impressed about those guys. And I remember, as I told you, we have to dream. We have to be happy in life. And then I used to go to dojo and I play with my, my friends, say, OK, let's fight. No, so now I fight like I'm Andy Hogg. And then I start fighting like Andy Hogg. <laughs> OK, now I fight like Kancho Matsui. And then I'll shoot him off, get it, this and that. <laughs> so now I fight like Masuda and then just get them all. So dreaming that we want to be like them. Yeah. So life is a dream. So dream, dream that your dream might come true. So you have to dream. And then I dreamed like fighting them. But actually, I was being them, not fight them, but I was being them. And then suddenly, they say, OK, so now you are going to the world tournament. I was like, wow, I'm going to Japan. Wow, the guy who come from this small city, it's like 10,000. People live in that city. It's yeah. a very small city. And suddenly, I'm going to Japan. I was like, wow. Oh. And then we knew that uh, Angie Hoog beat our, our coach, mm. Ademir Costa. And then it was like a revenge. <laughs> and then they prepared me. So this is also a very good thing. thing is if you prepare for something, you have a chance to have success. But if you don't prepare, of course, it's going to be impossible. Not impossible, but very, very difficult to have success. Even though when you prepare, you have difficulties to get what you, what you want. 
But if he, so if you don't prepare, it's even worse. So we prepared to fight, to fight Andy Hogg. And, but I didn't know if I was going to fight him. But on my mind, I was like, okay, I'm going to fight Andy Hogg. And every day in training, uh, as I said to you guys uh, at the class, every class we do Kihon. Every class, the first, uh, first 30 minutes, it's Kihon. Takes actually 35 minutes to complete Kihon. And when we do Maigiri, we kick 100 times, Mawashigiri, 100 times. And then when I was kicking Mawashigiri, I, always, I, I was always thinking about Kiki and his head. I was like imagining, I'm gonna kick his head, I'm gonna kick his head. And then come back home after, finish the day, sit down and close your eyes. Nobody taught me about meditation, things like that. But I was meditating without no. I was like, okay. And then I close my eyes and start thinking, okay, what have, done, what have I done today? And, and this actually uh, gets uh, uh, compared when my brother died makes me think about only thinking. So actually, it was not really, really a bad thing when my brother died, because we all are going to die. That's OK. So we just uh, need to be more relaxed and understand that things here come and goes just like, like this. So relax, enjoy life, be happy with what you're doing. And then I learned that actually, uh, in that time I didn't learn. But now I can, when I sit back, uh, OK, that's OK. That's, that's life. And also, that's life. Andy Hug taught me that, too. Mm. Uh, when he was fighting K1, sometimes he lose. And then for him, it was like, OK, that's life. He used to say, that's life. And then I was like, oh, that's good, because there is nothing you can do. So if you have a trouble, if you don't fix the trouble, the trouble is not fixed. That's the fix. When <laughs> it's not fixed, so done, finish. So for me, it was like that. And so I was preparing to fight Andy. Think about fighting him. Preparing, preparing. Go back, sit down, and start thinking. And now I think that I was going to the stage. I was going to the tatami to fight him. And my heart started <laughs> I started getting nervous. You see? So just thinking, your, your heart started beating fast. And then that is a kind of experience already. So, and I've been doing that so many times. When I was there to fight Andy, when I saw him, and then suddenly something, something cut, and uh, I came back to my dreams. Uh. And then I didn't know that I kicked him. The kick just come. And this is a very important thing, because you prepare yourself. So everybody prepare. Everybody wants to have something. You, you want to have something, but you prepare good. But in the day of the fight, you don't let things go. Your mind, your small mind, um, how do you say, um, bothers you, uh, get, make it complicated for you. Mm. Your small mind, the mind that everybody has here in the world, the big mind, it's inside of us, we all have this, can do anything if you relax. So you prepare. You prepare. And then the big mind know if you prepare. And then you relax. And things happen. And if actually happen, things good, you have a success. But if your small mind starts thinking, oh, 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 many, many people here. The first time you're in Japan. Oh, they, they rob you. The Japanese, they, they, they always stop the fight. So the small mind will say a lot of shit to you. If you pay attention, and then you're not relaxed, the big mind is not happening, and then your body that you prepare is a waste. You prepare for nothing. Right. So I was relaxed, and then I kick him without know that I kick. And same thing happened when I fought Ernest Hush, my big brother as well, <laughs> my big, 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 big friend. I, I, it was the same with him. Suddenly, I, I, I remember when we, we went down, I didn't know what happened. It was like I was hypnotized. And then people say, oh, you knock him out. I say, yeah, how? Because <laughs> I prepare, I prepare, and then I release. But then when I fought Mike Bernardo, yeah. I was on the ring, and then I saw Mike Bernardo coming, and then I was like, Mike Bernardo is coming. And, they, and then the small mind started <laughs> bothering me. And then I got to that. 
And I was like, oh, I'm in the ring, fight Mike Bernardo. And then suddenly, boom, a jab. And then I was like, oh, he, he jabbed me. And he did this, and he did that. And then he started doing a lot of things. And then I lost KO because I lost my concentration. Right. So that's the point. Well, <laughs> that was a great story. I mean, I've got so many more questions, but I think now that we already started talking about the mental rehearsing and mental training and stuff like that, um, we've spoken about this on the Mastermind previously. <clears throat> I uh, personally have spent a lot of time studying it and actually uh, incorporated it into my training at one point um, because it is such a powerful thing. And I learned this from a story I read about uh, in, in a book called Sports Mind. And um, the story was about a, a, a prisoner uh, who was dreaming about playing golf. And he had one book of this one golf field, and so he memorized the golf field. He memorized it, and he was lying in his prison cell just thinking about this field, knowing how the, the land is, the landscape is, and mentally rehearsing his swing. And so I don't remember how many years it was, but it took him a couple of years to get out of prison. He enters a golf tournament, and he wins the golf tournament, and they ask him, where did you come from? We've never seen you play golf before. And he said... <laughs> I, it was all up here. So it's that powerful. Um, but I mean, if I can just ask a, another, just a, just a quick little question that you can maybe dive into. So, so you knock Andy Hoog out. There was a lot of controversy about this knockout. Uh, if you guys have never seen it, go ahead and check it on YouTube. Uh, Francisco Filio versus Andy Hoog in the world tournament, uh, Kyokushin Karate. Um, because the fight's happening. <laughs> the fight's still happening. You're still engaged, both of you. It's not like Andy Hook dropped his hands and said, okay, just kick me in the head now. But the referee does say yame, and the kick does come after, kind of almost simultaneously with the yame. But in my opinion, it's a knockout. But some people say, this is bullshit. Regardless of what it was or what it didn't was, it was the result. You did win the fight. But now you've just knocked out Andy Hook. And there's, what, two more fights to become world champion? And you're 20 years old. Like, how does one deal with that? And, and how, does you, how do you mentally feel after that going, who was the next fight you were up against? Yamaki. Yamaki. Kenji? Yeah, so you're up against Yamaki in the next fight, right? So, so going from Andy to Yamaki, <laughs> how did you feel? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it seems that my mission was to fight Andy. It seems, if I see it now. But in that time, I want to be world champion that time. For my, for my side, I think that I want to be world champion. But then I face and Yamaki. And actually, we draw the first, first round. And then we draw the second round. And then we draw the third round. And then we went to the scale, to weights. And Yamaki was 11 kilos more than me. I was 92, Yamaki was 103. And then I was, I should be the win. You should win, it's more the than winner. 10 kilos. Yeah, yeah, and then I was okay, happy, but so Sai said, no, he saw, he saw the, the <laughs> Tameshwari, and as I, I told you two days ago, yesterday, yeah. that I'm really bad on <laughs> Kakato. Yeah. So I had zero in Kakato. He said, why? He said zero. Because we never practiced Tameshwari in Brazil. And then he said, no, so his Tameshwari is too low. So uh, Tameshwari, he loses to Yamak. So he, they fight one more time. <laughs> and then we fight one more time, and I lost because uh, there was... Three flags for him, one flag for me. And for me, I was happy because it seems that my mission was to fight Andy. Uh, that's how it ends. <laughs> yeah. Tamishibari is a, is a funny word. I'm going to just throw out a number here randomly, say 22 versus 19 boards. And we'll, we'll might have enough time to go back on that one, but I feel like now that you've, you've placed top in the world, right? You see Andy Hoog, you beat Andy Hoog. Andy Hoog, uh, after this world tournament with Sam Greco and Michael Thompson, they all end up leaving Kyokushin. They all decided to do this new thing called the K1. And the K1 was just starting in, I think it was 1991, the first, the first couple of tournaments they had. I think the first world think. championships was in 93. Yeah. I think Branko Skacik was the first actual world championship. But they were doing, they were doing promotions, they were doing uh, Seiro Kaikan stuff. And um, while I was still in Uchideshi, on the day that I actually graduated from Uchideshi, um, Andy Hoog and Michael Thompson and Sam Greco, they all came and visited Sosa and said, thank you very much for everything. We're leaving Kyokushin. We're going to Seido Kaikan. Now, we're, we spend a lot of time on, on talking about these things, but I think I want to just dive right into what happens after the next world tournament uh, for you. Uh, we all know you win. 
Um, but then you get drawn into this, this incredible affection for wanting to fight in K1. Um, clearly, Andy Hoog and, and Sam Greco and those guys, they all paved that way for it. Solstice has now passed away. Uh, they're not the same attitude towards K1 because K1 now is on golden time, prime time TV, and the, the K1 superstars from that genre, the senseis that are here on the camp teaching, the Peter Arts, is the, the Ernesto Hoost, and uh, Semi Shield came a little bit after, but those guys were superstars in Japan, and they were making a lot of money. I don't know how much, but they were making a lot of money. <laughs> and so, why? Why did you feel the attraction to go there? And this is what comes again, incredible story, because your first fight is against Andy Hu in K1, when he is the defending champion of the K1. Let's, uh, let's see how much you can talk about that um, and, and in a short, like condensed version of it. Os? Os, I'll try. So, <clears throat> again, was like dreaming. I, Andy Hu left our organization and went to K1. I was like, wow. And then, he was fighting punch to the face, and, and, and then I asked myself, oh. And I consider myself one of the best in, Kyo, in Kyokushin in the world. By that time, I was 25, 24, 25. And then I say, but I don't know if I, um, if I meet Peter Arts on the street and we have a fight, I think I'm gonna have a trouble. So I want to test myself. Mm -hmm. I ask myself, I want to test myself. So as a challenge. Okay, and then I said, I would like to fight in K1. And then the organization said, yes, you will be the first one to represent our organization to fight in K1. And then was like a big thing to me again. And one, another, um, another thing that I think is very important for us uh, is not to fear nothing. Uh, because if you really see something, uh, take the courage to face it face it. Even though uh, you think you are not have good conditions to, to overcome that, the condition is not everything. Desire is more important than the condition. Sometimes you, you see people very skinny, but as the, the champion right now, he's not so strong, not like physically strong, but his desire is bigger than anything else. So it's not your condition, but what you want that might happen, what you want. Because if you want with your big, big mind, not with a small, small mind, so you have to really concentrate. That's why I say meditation is really important. You have to sit down and see actually what you really want, not your small mind. The big mind, what the big mind wants. And then I said, okay, I want to be there. And then I don't know kickboxing, but I say, no care. I just want to be there because I think it's nice, and I want. And then, so I was there. And they gave me two months to prepare for kickbox, for the first match in kickbox. And then there was me and Glaube. And then uh, they send us to America. They say, go to Seattle to train. But my passport, uh, I had some, pro I was living in Japan, Glaube was living in Brazil, and Glaube was much easier for him to get the, the visa to go to, Japan, uh, to America. And then he was to America, he went to America one week before me. So he learned kickbox before me. He's my senpai in kickboxing. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I came there, and then he's like, see, this is the sequence, this, this. And I say, what, Glaube, you are good. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, and then, man, I was terrible. I was terrified to get punched in the face. I say, please, don't punch my face. No, no, don't do this. And then, only two months, but desire. I want to win, so no matter what, confidence. And then I went to fight Andy, thinking that I'll be able to knock him out. Not really knock him out, but win the fight. That's what I want. It doesn't matter how. I, I, I didn't predict that I was going to give him a right hook, no way, I, I haven't trained that. That's strange. Maybe there was something inside me that I didn't know, <laughs> because I remember my coach said, oh, when you go to the fight, don't throw the right hook. <laughs> because you get too open when you do this. But then, fight start, and then I, poof, and fall down, I say, what? <laughs> it was me, it was like, it was me. I, 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 was, I was shocked as well. Everybody was shocked, and me too. I was like, so something 
from behind. It's working without we know we don't know. <laughs> without without our, no, our we notice something is happening because I believe that something be ha happened before and then finally comes. It's something like that. This you think and then happen. <laughs> okay, something like that. And then two fights. Uh, no, next fight. The guy said, no, you cannot do Shirogiri, my second <laughs> fight. And then when I start fighting, the guy comes and then Shirogiri, Ippon. And then my coach said, okay, oh, next time you do whatever you want to do. I don't say anything <laughs> no more. So for me, and then he started facing all these guys and asked who said, so for me it was only uh, always big dreams. And one very important thing is uh, anytime our philosophy, Kyokushin philosophy, uh, with society's words, is that we have to keep our head low to start everything, everything. You don't think that you are the best. You think that you have way to learn. So if you always put your heads down as modesty, but look up, this look up is the dream. You have to have a dream. What do you want? But not only this, you have to be quiet. Shout your mouth, serenity. But what's this shout your mouth? It's not your mouth. It's what come. Because mouth say words. That word is your mind. Your small mind say things. If you, you have to shut, you say, hey, don't say no more. Big heart. Big heart, I think it's this big mind. And big heart. And then you treat people as you would like to be treated. So, and then, because we all one mind, we all the big mind all together. So that's why you have to open. Once you open, and then we're gonna have all always good time. Mm. <laughs> Fascinating stories for real. I mean, um, there's there's so much more to like deep dive into and ask questions about it. But because I also know you uh, personally, there there are some stories that I would like to like share with you guys. For example, leading up to the world tournament, um, you were asked to do a 100-man kumite. And I think you told me once, you said you actually didn't want to do it. Is this true? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't think anyone I've ever met have ever told me that they actually want to do a 100-man kumite. I refused three times. <laughs> you refused three. I say no, and then one month later, no, and then they went to Brazil. And they say, okay, now you have to do it. And they're like, okay, so let's do it. And then I prepare myself. Now, this is what I want to hear about. Listen, let's listen a little bit to what he did to prepare himself for this 100-man kumite, <laughs> which takes about four hours, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so as I said, everything is about preparation. So uh, I said, OK, I, we have to do, so I want to do it good. So I prepare. It was about three, four months only. And then Glaube used to help me a lot. And what we used to do is, Go for a run for like 10 hours, uh, 10 hours now, 10 kilometers. <laughs> 10 kilometers run, and then come back to Dojo, and then start hit the meat. So we put this Brazilian meat, it's like uh, legs and chest and here. It looks like a robot, it robot. looks like a Gundam, yeah. basically. And then we start with 30 rounds, 30 rounds of two minutes. Glaube was holding that for me. <laughs> And then after that, we used to go to Makiwara for like half an hour. Arms, right, left, half an hour, legs. So it was like two hours. And then one hour run, and then one hour uh, big meat. Yeah. That's when we start. And then at the end, we were doing 100 rounds. 100 rounds of two minutes. A hundred rounds of two minutes. Let that just sink that in a little bit. <laughs> a hundred rounds of two minutes. And Glaube was the one who was uh, keeping the, the time, the watch. He has to see two minutes and relax 30 seconds. 30 seconds rest and two minutes. And then he was missed it up like, oh. <laughs> dum, dum. And he said after his teeth was painful. He yeah. hurt his teeth. So hundred rounds. And then this gave me a very good condition. And then one month before, <laughs> one month before, we say, OK, let's try to do in Brazil first. And then we hired 100 people. And then we did 
and it took me like three, four hours, and no injury, nothing happened to me. I feel very good, I say, okay. So now I have an idea what I'm going to face when I go to Japan. And then the program was, every Friday I had to do 50 fights. And then during these fights, this was on Sunday when I did 100 men comité, and then Friday I tried to do 50, and then the guy kicked on my knee, and my knee was like this with water. And I was like, oh man. And it was like three weeks before the 100 men in Japan. And, and then I went to the doctor, and then the doctor did the infiltration. Yeah, to suck it up, suck, suck the water out. Yeah. The water. And he said, so now we have to calm down. And that was actually good, yeah. because I reduced my training. And then I was much strong when I went to Japan to do the Hyakunin yeah. Kumite. So just to clarify, on the same day, uh, Yamaki Kenji also did a 100-man Kumite. And he went from the 100-man Kumite dojo straight to hospital. Uh, maybe you could clarify for me, but I think your wife at the time wanted to go to Disneyland the next day. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. he's in Disneyland, right? <laughs> this is a true story, right? Yeah. <laughs> and Disneyland was so hard to me, believe me. More hard than 100 men Kumite. <laughs> to stay on the lines, actually, it's so difficult. Because, of course, I'm, I was tired. But to stay like two hours on line, like, and I was a little bit sore. <laughs> <laughs> but then, OK, uh, let's go. Uh, and that's the good thing about being famous. You know, I, I'll tell you uh, the good thing about being famous. Just after, I start fighting K1. And then they treat you different. But I'm the same guy. But they treat you different. And then I went to Disney. And I didn't know I was that famous in Japan. And then suddenly, many people were like, Phil is here, Phil is here. And then we were playing, and then take lines. And I was tired. I said, I don't want to go to that. I don't want to play this. No, I stay here. And then suddenly, when we leave one, one game, we, le we left, and then we went there, and then there was a fan, and then came one, two, three, four, hundred, two hundred. So many people came. And then the badge guard came, the guards, the... The, the guardmen, yeah. yeah. They came, and they stopped. And they say, Filio, why do you do, what are you doing? I say, what? I'm here for fun. And say, no, no. You have to tell us that you come here, and then we prepare for yourself. And then next time, I said, OK, we are going. All, all the time, we used to go there. And then you came with me once, yeah. right? And then you go in a special room when you are famous. <laughs> and then they treat you different. <laughs> and then you sit down, and then you take photo with Pluto, with Mickey, with uh, Donald. <laughs> and then you like, oh. and then if you want to go for a, a ride, and then you don't take the line. You go from behind. And then that, there was no more fun. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's very interesting, right? So, I mean, you, you guys have absolutely no idea how famous he became. When he debuted in, in K1 and knocked out Andy Hook for the second time of his career with the punch, it was within like 20 seconds or something. That thing created something called the Ichigeki, and Japan was completely crazy for Francisco Filio. He was on TV, magazines, radio, you name it. He did everything. And he literally could not walk down the street without having people mobbing him. Uh, it was absolutely crazy. Um, but um, many, many years later, I had my hips replaced. Now they're titanium. And I have a special pass because I'm now classified as a handicapped person. So if I go to Disneyland, I also don't have to wait in line. <laughs> 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 they take me through the back. <laughs> Uh, but that's a, that's a whole different story. No, but fortune and fame. I think we started off this, this discussion here on this panel really early on with, with, you know, getting to know Francisco Filio when you were a little boy. And you came from a little city in the northern of Brazil. And now Disneyland is like telling you to, um, you know, call before you go. All right? That's crazy. Um, we're going to kind of wrap it up and maybe take a couple of questions if anyone has questions before because we got to get ready for the training session. But um, is there any um, story or is there any takeaway that you would want to share with everybody before we ask if there's any questions? Well, 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 actually there are a lot. Um, but what I always want to try to tell you is that life is great. So grab that opportunity to be happy, to do what you really, really want to do. And don't worry too much about the result. But think in what you want. That's the most important thing. What I want. And then enjoy by 
go into that area, go into that place to, to where you want to get. But don't worry about get. For example, I want to be world champion, but if I think too much about being world champion, that's bother me and I actually I don't get. So the best thing is for you just to, okay, wish, wish. So try to wish, okay? Question, please. <laughs> yeah, great. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Time in your life, in your career, that you've been uh, near the time that you wanted to quit. Something that was so hard for you in your personal life, in your training, or something else, maybe. You've lived uh, too far away from your home. Was there a time that you wanted to quit, but someone pushed you about that life? Yeah, wow, well, yes, there were a couple times. Um, when I was about to get brown belt, uh, my father, my father decided um, decide to, no, no, my, my, my older brother was the one who paid the fee, monthly fee for dojo for, uh, to train. And, and then uh, he, he had to move back to our city because he was a, a bank employee and then if he come back to that city, he get more money. But, and then he was, uh, almost 20, 22, stuff like that. So he wants to live by himself. So he, he would not help our family no more. And then he moved back to the city, and then my father said, no, we don't have money to pay you. And my mother was against, I trained. My mother was saying, no, no, uh, better to keep the money. So, and then I was like, okay, I'm going to give up. And then I say, okay, I have to give up. But as God wish, say, say, ask me to go to start uh, Uchideshi, like Uchideshi, Brazil, when I was 14 years old. And then uh, I remember I could not pay my belt. I, uh, I, too much money for me to pay. But he said, with the salary that I'm going to pay you, you can cover half. Mm. With the salary, one month salary, you get half of the brown belt. So the salary was really, really low, really low salary. But it was okay. And then because of that, I continue. But I want to give up. And then suddenly, Something happened, God's wish, and then I, I, I kept training. Uh, that was the first time that I thought I was going to, to stop. But then the second time was oh, when uh, I prepared for the second world tournament that I participated when I was uh, 24 years old. So I have been through so many things in four years, since 1991 to 95. I've done ev anything that they ask me. They, they say, okay, you have to do this, this, and that to be champion. And I'll do it without question. So I was really red. And I went through 100 men committee. And then I, I remember in that year, I went to Europe for a tour. And then I met Nicholas first time there in, in the Romanian uh, European tournament. Uh, and then I was just looking for, okay, so he's a good fighter, this and that. So I was preparing myself to be the world champion that year. Uh, I remember in, in our city, there was a, a newspaper, one page, one homepage say, Francisco Filho, the Iron Man. He's going to be the world champion, the first known Japanese. So everything was set. And Shihanzobi said to me, so once you get the world champion, oh man, and then you, you have anything you want. You're going to have car, house, uh, you, you have a book, you go to the movies and this and that. I was like, yes, I, that's what I'm going to do. That was my dream. I was like, okay, I was expecting that. And suddenly, whew, there was no more. And then for me, it was like, they took off the floor and I fell down. I was like, I don't want to do anything else. I really felt bad. I was like, okay, I give up. So I, I, I did everything. So I, it's impossible for me to do anything more to be world champion, I thought. So I give up. I say, okay. And then no train for like two months. Got like 12, 20 kilos over. And then a friend of mine, so it's very important for you to be supported by friends because friends put you up again. And then friends say, come on, man, believe in yourself, you're good, you're this and that. And then suddenly, I was in the game again because of my friends. Mm. Interesting. You find any good, you are saying, uh, I'm medication, I'm taking all the fight. Every fight you do that? Yes. For, uh, for every preparation, when I prepare, every time I go back home, take a shower, 
eat, and then before sleep, think. Before Hyakuni Kumite, 100 men fights, every day. And then there was, there was one night. I sat down, and I meditate, and then I went to sleep, and then I started dreaming that I was fighting. I was fighting, and then fight one, fight two, three, four, and then it was like 67, 60 something, and six, six, eight, don't, it doesn't go for the next it's one, off. doesn't move. And then 60, 60, I'm like, oh, 60, 60. And then I was like, ah, and then I start punch. I start punch. And then I got up, I was sweat. I was fighting already. I was preparing myself, actually. And then that's how deep you go when you, you really meditate. Because I don't know how, but you're thinking, and, and, and you don't want to move, but you move. Easy fight? Yeah. No, no, for all tournaments. For all tournaments, I prepare before. I remember when I went to the South America tournament, I said, okay, so before I look at my shin and I say, tomorrow I'm gonna smash you. <laughs> I, I'm gonna kick so hard, I don't care about my shin. I will start talking to my shin and say, I, I'm gonna kick hard, I don't care. So prepare, all the time try to prepare. I fight. fight for money or fight for you? No, fight because I like to fight. And then I think it's a very good and important thing is to be rewarded. You, you must get money. Otherwise, you cannot survive. But it's not that I fight because I want money. I fight and the money comes. That's the way it goes. How you start your day? How I start my day? Um, uh, usually, uh, for example, this morning, I like, I like always to put some music. So to turn vibration, to put the energy up. So sometimes you wake up, you go like, oh, you have bad dreams, stuff like that. But then if you change your energy, because it's all about feeling, uh, you have to have this connection. And then I like to put uh, meditation music to change the vibration, and then have a good feeling. And uh, 20 years at, uh, here, 20 years back, they had no energy. How you start your day? Uh, singing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's singing. Ah, la, la, la. If you just do this, and also uh, radio, radio. I always like to uh, listen to music. Even when we are training, I like to listen to music. Uh, because just... It make the, the vibration, it's, it's good. Okay. Yeah. But there's not for so. The chance of believing that is, there is uh, your weaknesses. Sorry? Your weaknesses. My weakness. Um, um, uh, would be my mind. I, if I Pay attention to my small mind because I never think like any technique will bother me. It's always about something big, bigger. It's not about the small things, it's not about detail, it's not about one person or about his technique or this or that. So it's to be prepared and be relaxed. That's my weakness. If I'm not prepared, if, if I get confused, if somebody confuses me with some words and then I'll be in trouble. That's, that's my weakness. Yeah, that was very difficult. When your body hurts, you really don't know how to lose because you don't become awake. No. <clears throat> I'm going to try and, and clarify what training for this man means. Because I've spent a lot of time on training camps with him. When we would go and train for K1 fights in America, we would go up, get up in the morning, we would run the lake, which is about five miles, so seven, eight kilometers around the lake. Then we'd drive down to the swimming pool. We'd do 18 laps in the pool. Then we'd have lunch and then take a small break. Then we'd go to the gym and work out for two, maybe three hours in kickboxing. Wait, with sparring. Wait, wait, before we had the stairs and then we have the weights. Oh, it's shit, four no. things in the morning. <laughs> stairs, run, swimming, and weights. <laughs> The weights is in the evening. The weights is the last thing we did. No, but it's true. We, that's right. 
Run to the, yeah, drive down to the university, do 26 stairs around the stadium, the stairs. up and down. <laughs> right? And that is it's really hard. Then we run the lake, then 18 laps, okay? And then lunch, and then three hours of kickboxing, then dinner, then weight training. Every day, six days a week. And then Sunday, we could go and watch a movie. And who did that program? Him. <laughs> Him. We spend a lot of time here on the Mastermind talking about what overtraining is, right? But for someone who is okay with doing 100 rounds of two minutes on the pads, there is no such thing as overtraining. Talk about overtraining, and I know him very well. We would get through the month of training, we'd get to Japan, we'd be in the hotel, in the hotel, right? And he'd be putting his bed up against the wall and he'd be working out for two hours. The day before the fight. Yeah. He never stopped training. Like normal people, they taper down, they take it easy, they take a couple of days off maybe, not him. He trained all the way up until the day before the fight. For him, uh, correct me if I'm yeah. wrong, it is because it's just part of the journey. It's part of the, the fight is also just part of the training. It, that's how it looked like for me. Yeah. I thought he was crazy. I actually thought he was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you can have the microphone back now. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Yeah, it's always a challenge. Always, always a challenge. All right, we'll do. You've already had one, sir. We'll do the last one up there. Yeah, I was supposed to have, but usually uh, it was also uh, a fight. Uh, Something that makes makes you even stronger. Um, it's a funny thing. You guys may not believe what I will say, but it's really true. And I have uh, Shihan Zobi as a witness, <laughs> if it's necessary. But um, before the world tournament, the, the, the next, the second world tournament that I fought, um, because I was only 92 kilos, and we decided to put more weight on me. But we didn't have a, a nutritionist. Nutritionist, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then Shahizov just said, we, we have to eat a lot. And then I used to train very hard with him. And for two hours training with the tubes, with the elastic thing, you know. And then two hours, but no drink. And that was the last session of the, of the day. So we start training in the morning, afternoon, and then teach. And then last session, two hours with Shahizov, and then go to his house. And then... I can drink and eat. So finish train at nine, uh, start at nine, finish at 11, and then go to his house. It, this is the evening, midnight, we start eating at midnight. And then there was a scale on his house, and then I weigh myself, and I was already like 97 kilos, but we won't ask to, me to go over 100 kilos. And then I, okay, so I have to eat three kilos. <laughs> <laughs> and then we sit down, uh, okay, Sean, let's eat. And then we start eating. And then it was midnight, and then one hour, uh, two hours. And then almost, about two hours and a half, not three, but two hours and a half, I was here with food. I was like, Tchow. and then I say, oh, Sean, I'm satisfied. But he's like, okay, but uh, Kyoko-san, he asked his wife, Kyoko-san, uh, we have bananas, right? <laughs> and would you like banana? And I, Oss. <laughs> And then he brought me, she brought me not, not one, but maybe 10 bananas. And then I ate bananas. Oh. And then he's like, oh, uh, there is ice cream, right? And she, uh, yes, ice cream. We would like ice cream. Oh. And then they brought my ice cream. The vanilla ice cream, not vanilla, uh, vanilla and chocolate ice cream together. I don't know how to call that. We saw flocos. But vanilla and chocolate ice cream, I hate it. No, don't, ask, don't give me vanilla and chocolate because I remember that time. I, then I took this vanilla and chocolate ice cream and then I was about to puke. And then I stood up, I took the plate and said, Sean, oh, I'm satisfied. And I went to the kitchen. But before they go to the kitchen, there was a uh, toilet. And then I went to the toilet and I started puke. <laughs> because too much food and too much drink. No drink for two hours, and then have to wait to get to his house. And then there was two liters of water and two liters of Coca-Cola. No good Coca-Cola, but it was Coca-Cola. <laughs> so that's my diet. So this is already four kilos. And then 
before 97 kilos, and then after 103 kilos, my record. <laughs> Six kilos in one meal. And I'm telling you the truth, it's not, I'm not lying. So there was no such a thing as diet for us. Well, like, just beat yourself. And actually, Shehan Zobi told me that Sosai used to say that it's really important for us to understand the other side of things. So to be world champion, I cannot think as a, a normal, uh, like a, not a normal, but a ordinary. Ordinary, ordinary man. I have to have a different mind. I have to think differently. Because if you think like ordinary people, it, we're going to be ordinary people. So we have to think something different. So he was saying about the omote yura. Omote yura. You must know the other side. So by eating, he said, if you eat and then you put a lot of food inside of you, and food is good, make you feel good when you eat, right? You're like, oh, I'm hungry, and then you eat, you feel good. So, and then these ordinary people think this. But me, I was like, oh, food. Mm. I know that food is, is not always good, because I've been through that, oh, this, what I felt was so bad, so weird, the sensation. And then my mind start think different. I can see food in two different ways, not just one. So now, if I see, oh, the Japanese is always the world champion. And everybody around think, yes, Japanese is world champion. Ordinary people think the same. But I say, oh, there are two ways. I think I can be the world champion as well. So if you don't think different, you have no chance to be. Hmm. So basically, there was no nutritionist plan at all. It was eat as much as you could on a regular basis. And they ate a lot, trust me. It's Brazil, it's churrasco, right? Yeah. <laughs> a lot of beef. I would like to say thank you very much for coming on the show thank today. You. It you. has been an honor, thank a pleasure. You. And uh, Francisco Villion. <laughs> thank you, Nick. I really enjoy, man. Yeah. Nice, nice, very nice. Thank you, everybody.